you know, I nearly died twice uh, that day. Everybody has no more than a couple of degrees of separation from that event. Our staff was in shock. The community was in shock. Going through something like that, not just me, but everybody that was there, it's going to be with me the rest of my life. Let it break your heart. If it did, let it. By providing that setting, by providing that front lawn, it did provide for some healing. This is not about January 8th, but it's about what's happened since then. People were angry and people were upset, but when we got to the memorial and we were able to really take time to reflect as one community and as one country, we really started looking forward. No one who lives here was untouched by the events of last Saturday. We are here to try, in a small way, to bring comfort to those whose lives have been forever changed by an act so heinous that it is simply impossible to comprehend. We hope that we can begin the process of healing. Saturday morning, January 8th in Tucson, Arizona was chilly with steel blue winter skies. At 10 o'clock, Tucson native and newly re-elected Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and her staff began her 21st Congress on Your Corner at a Northwest Neighborhood Shopping Center. Affectionately known as Gabby, Representative Giffords relied on this public interaction to establish direct personal access to her constituents. Minutes after the event began, a man rushed into the gathering crowd, pulled out his pistol, and fired at point-blank range. Six people died. Federal Judge John Roll, Phyllis Schneck, Dorwin Stoddard, Dorothy Morris, nine-year-old Christina Taylor Green, and Gifford staffer Gabe Zimmerman. 13 people lay injured, many critically. And in the aftermath, the Tucson community itself was gravely wounded. I woke up a little bit late, but I still would have been on time had I gone to the right Safeway. I went to the wrong Safeway. It was the first uh, appearance the Congresswoman uh, was making since a very contentious election. We decided that before things get going, we wanted to get a Starbucks coffee. Pam Simon goes up to Gabe and says, can I get you a, a cup of coffee? And Gabe says, Pam, don't forget Daniel. Daniel Hernandez was a brand new intern. I'd only met him once. The very last thing that Gabe ever said to me is, remember the other guy. Christina was there to meet her congresswoman. That was clear. I remember she was excited about going. I made her a big omelet for a... Uh, for breakfast. I was not only going to see my congresswoman, but my friend. I arrived just as the congresswoman was arriving. Um, we gave each other a hug. She uh, said to me, good morning, Mark, and hugged me. I turned to him and I said, gosh, I would love to stay and shake Gabrielle Gifford's hand, but I didn't think that he would wait with me. And so we just continued to go into the store. So we went to get Brussels sprouts at the Safeway. So the congresswoman said, let's do it, let's get going. And so we, we took our customary position. We got to be next in line. Um, the Tuckers were up with Gabby, and we stood up and we were chatting with Gabe Zimmerman. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Judge Roll, and he said, but I can see she's busy. I said, no, she'll want to say, no, you're here, just stand right here. And as soon as she's finished talking to these folks, I'll tell her you're here and she'll want to at least say hello. We were literally leaning over the table and at that moment um, a, a person appeared and the, the sound I remember is a gasp. Then the shooting started. And that's when the gunman came and uh, shot her and shot me and shot Joel and, and the others. The next thing I knew, Gabe, 
Gabe was pretty much shot right in front of us. The first bang that I heard, I thought it was maybe a firework. I saw Gabby go down, Ron go down, and I must have been hit very shortly after that. I, I have not quite understood what possessed me, but I got up and I hit the, ran up behind him and hit the, him as hard as I could from behind. And about that time, Mr. Badger, Colonel Badger, was pretty much hitting him from the front. And we toppled down and he fell onto his right side with his arm stretched out with a gun in it. As I went through the door, knowing there were gunshots, and I heard somebody yelling that they got the shooter, they got the shooter. So I felt a little bit better about stepping over some people who are no longer with us to get to Congresswoman Giffords. Christina was there. I, the tables that the staff had set up had um, tablecloths on them. So I took off one of those tablecloths and put it around her so that she wouldn't be so cold. And as I lay on the ground, I saw the congresswoman facing away from me, very shallow breathing, and I knew she was still alive. Uh, and then the, the, then the citizen heroes came to us. And someone said they shot Congresswoman Giffords. So I said, I've got to be out there. I'm a nurse. Got to the first two or three folks, realized that some of them weren't going to make it. Walked one step outside the door, and uh, people were just down like dominoes. And I remember saying to him, Daniel, I'm, I'm doing fine. You know, go, see the con go to the congresswoman, stay with the congresswoman, make sure that she's OK. But uh, Daniel Hernandez was already with her as I helped pull her off of the window. And she's taken care of now if we can get somebody pushing on the chest here, if we can get somebody pushing on a groin there. You know, we, we sort of take care of people. Look over to the right, and I saw Pam Simon. And someone went up to Pam Simon, and someone saying, she's a goner. Several first responders said, we assumed you were dead and just stepped over you. The first person I encountered was Judge Roll. And so uh, I put him on his back and started doing CPR immediately. My eyes were closing, and I thought to myself, if I close my eyes, I won't open them again. I've got to keep these eyes open. And so he, he went down and made sure that everyone was with somebody to take care of them, as he said, plug their holes. Then my hero, Dr. David Bowman, realized that there was a child there, and he arrived and began to uh, um, work with Christina with CPR. You know, death just passed right over us, literally. And for there was not a soul around us that did not either get seriously injured or killed. A good Samaritan arrived and touched my shoulder and said, I'm not a medical person, but I'm going to stay with you. I mean, I knew in my heart that, that Judge Roll was gone, but I needed somebody with authority to come and tell me that it was okay to stop CPR. <laughs> So I did, and I just, I just looked at him, and I, I, I said, I, I'm so, so sorry. Someone picked up the gun and was yelling at Pat to give him the clip. He was going to shoot him right on the spot. It seemed like it was an infinity, but I know it was m minutes before the, the first sheriffs were on the scene. When the first officer got there, I met him at the car and I said, they have the shooter down over there. They need help. There was one uh, female sheriff's deputy who uh, was one of the very first ones there. And at that point, I felt so defeated. I thought, my gosh, we have Pam Simon with a chest wound, this woman here with a chest wound, this man with a chest wound. These people are not going to survive. A while later, this, this female deputy um, came up to me, um, knowing that I worked for the congresswoman and uh, was in tears. She hugged me and said, I'm so sorry I couldn't get here sooner. Uh, they wouldn't pull over for my siren.
when we go through losses that are part of the normal fabric of lives, you know, we expect perhaps to lose our parents, for example. We find ritual for that. It's part of what we expect. When we go through tragedy that we can't foresee, uh, our, our process of healing can be very compounded, very overwhelming. Tragedy and trauma almost always make grief complicated. And for people who weren't directly involved, that might be, but certainly for those directly involved and for people who are first responders. There were some people who will never want to talk about it again. There are some people who have to tell the story over and over and over. And I would say both of those things are normal. So for the people who need to talk, they might need to talk a lot. And they might be asked to talk a lot because the people around them want to know as well. What was it like? What was it like for you? Because the people around them are also trying to make sense of things. The first sure. paramedics that arrived on the scene, David was the triage. So, you know, they, they came right to him and he said, the little girl goes first. Second is Congresswoman Giffords. So they got out, they went by ambulance. She was the first one that came in the door and I happened to be in trauma four and that's where we put her and worked on her, you know, for what we thought we could do. And then we had to move on because we had so many more people coming in. He says he moved on to the next patient, but he made sure she was taken care of with dignity. And um, I know what it took for him. We all know what it took for him to take care of a little girl in that situation. Carl probably was impacted the most because, uh, you, know, you know, she's nine years old and uh, she was the first victim to come in. <clears throat> and we weren't sure if that was going to set the precedence of what else was coming in. Uh, then a congresswoman comes in. Um, the first patient that I got that I got to take care of was actually Miss Giffords. I just stopped for a second and took a deep breath and knew that I knew that was her. So I didn't know who she was. So I mean, I, I knew who she was, but I didn't know who she was when she came in. Everyone that came in, you didn't know their first or last name. They were all given what we call trauma names. When the scene became secure. Um, he and I held each other. Um, some enterprising f photographer with a long lens got a picture of the two of us standing, holding each other. And I look at that picture occasionally and uh, rarely, if ever, have I had a f that look on my face. It's the kind of look you get when your mother passes away. All the families were coming here and we were trying to kind of match families um, with their patients. And that was probably one of the more challenging things is that there were the people in the waiting room had the TV on and they were starting to hear more than those of us working. When I answered the phone, I said, hey, you know, what's going on? You know, she was screaming. Um, she said there's been a shooting. Everyone got shot. My sister tried to call mom. She also couldn't get a hold of her, so she called me. She described what had gone on, and I said to her, I wouldn't worry about this. Mom would not go to a political rally, certainly not a Democratic political rally, and she doesn't shop at Safeway. And then I got a call from, from Kelly saying that there's, uh, Gabrielle's been shot, we're going to the hospital, we don't know where Gabe is. And I said, I'm on my way. I'm on my way, Sarah. And she said, you don't want to see this. Don't come. Don't come. Mark calls. He said, uh, CJ, you've got to get back to Tucson. There's been a shooting. Gabby's been hit. Ron's been hit. And I think Gabe is dead. And we couldn't find him at any of the emergency rooms because we were hoping he'd been only mildly wounded. And after a time, it started to dawn on us that we weren't finding him in any emergency room because he wasn't in any of the emergency rooms. And I got a horrible sinking feeling. We knew there was, you know, something was wrong. We thought it was maybe a car accident. 
once I saw all the police outside, and I still couldn't f fathom what it was, but, but I knew something major had happened. It was like the weight of the world on top of you, just, you know, knowing nothing was ever going to be the same. From the moment I was wheeled into the hospital, I had this sense that everything was working like clockwork. I remember going to every trauma room because someone said it was Gabrielle Giffords. So we went to every trauma room because they were all full of gunshot victims and asked each person their name until actually, I think we might be in the room Gabrielle was in. And um, I recognized her. Dr. Freeze grabbed me and he says, Gabrielle Gifford's been shot in the head. Come talk to the family with me. Clearly, when I recognized who was there, it was quite a surreal moment. And, and certainly, uh, certainly things seemed to pause for a millisecond and as it sunk in. Once you deal with that for the millisecond, then you're treating just anyone else. And you're doing the same thing as you would for any other patient. All of a sudden, they just descended on me and uh, um, question. then everything changed. It was the beginning of uh, uh, a horrible, horrible chapter. I remember Dorothy Stoddard um, who was down here and I met her lovely daughters and her, um, her family and the heroics in that lady, because she lost her husband, her husband ended up dying on top of her. Um, she had gunshot wounds and she was crying and worried about Gabby Giffords and all the other people who were shot. Not herself, not her own situation. Come 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was pretty quiet in here. Day in the life was, it was kind of done. Pretty full, I think, at the time, so it was just a matter of logistics of where to put everybody and how to deal with the media that was coming in or wanting to come in and that kind of thing. Another coworker and I were going through the normal routine as far as, you know, is there any family that we can notify for you? You know, we had this gentleman that came in. His remark was, my wife, and she was just murdered. And I think at that very moment, the other nurse and I looked at each other, and that was probably the first time that it hit me of the magnitude of what happened. He called her his girlfriend. He had called her that for, you know, the 60 years they'd been together. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. He was very calm, you know, and just, my wife is gone, my girlfriend. And, you know, told me about how they met, told me all these wonderful things. And then said, and I'm a Republican, all I had to do, I just wanted to ask her a question. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed, you know, and he said it was about gun control. There was a lot of, a lot of people just in, in, in utter distraught. They just didn't know what to do with themselves. Some people stayed at the bedside and just cried. Um, other people reacted with anger. With the only local level one trauma center, University Medical Center received more patients than any other hospital. There, at bedsides, in the hallways and chapels, the healing and recovery of the wounded and their families began. First, the physical mending, and then later, and often much more slowly, the emotional healing. Even hours after the first medical response, some of those who would be most deeply affected had not yet heard all the news. I think about 7.45, Ernie was on the phone with BJ and the doorbell rang and it was the police. Tucson law enforcement had contacted the New Jersey law enforcement and they were there to tell Ernie that it had been our mother. He called my sister and my sister called me. Um, it's a very primal feeling that you have when you get news like that. Some of the first visitors that came were two of the staff members. I could tell by their faces that there was more to the story 
and I wasn't counting noses. I just said, don't tell me anything right now. First time I saw them was when I was in the uh, uh, recovery uh, area in the hospital after surgery, and I opened my eyes, and there they were, kind of, you know, all looking down at me, and uh, it was the first face I saw was Nancy's, my wife. It was the best sight, you know, because I knew that I was going to make it at that point. At about 9 o'clock, Ron wanted to see myself and my husband, and so they took me to Ron's room, and... Um, he was hooked up and in obvious pain, and he said to me, go thank the people. And I said, what? He said, go thank the people who are out at the memorials. He had grasped this concept that there had been spontaneous um, memorials set up. Every time I walked by, it seemed like it had doubled in size. And it wasn't just things for Gabby, it was things for Gabe, it was things for Darwin Stoddard, it was things for Christina, it was things for all of the victims. At least once a day, often several times a day, I would walk through the uh, memorial in front of the hospital. And I, I never ceased to be deeply moved by that. And there were times during the stress of this whole event, and not only for myself, but also for other administrators, or other clinical staff people, you could see that they needed to, to decompress a bit. And so you'd see them just coming down to the front lawn of the hospital. It was beautiful to see the, the community come together the way it did and understand it wasn't, wasn't just the trauma surgeons, it wasn't just the hospital, I mean, it was the community. And that's what I think seeing the front of the hospital every day and all the people that came out, left their lives, their jobs, brought their children from all over. And it, you know, when, when you see that and you see the, the type of community you live in, and, I think that, that just makes you even love what you do even more, to know that you have people like that you can serve. There was a reason that memorials bloomed around the city. People had to do something to acknowledge that it had an impact in their lives. Some people, uh, they call this uh, a more intuitive style of grief. They want to feel, they want to cry, they want to write, they want to reach out, they want to sit in community and talk about how it affected them. It's going to be much harder, I think, to find people in this town who weren't affected than who were, because so many people had a connection to the people who were there that day. So they took me down on Thursday, this was Thursday after the shooting, and it was an emotional experience of uh, great significance. I, I wept a lot as I saw what people had done. Amazing experience looking at what people had chosen to do, which I think was a sign of a very healthy community. The community took a, a really a traumatic experience and turned it into something different. At the memorial outside of UMC, there was a veteran who handed his purple heart to me, and he didn't want any recognition. I went out in the evening in a wheelchair with my family. The candles were lit. It was surreal. How could this be Tucson, and how could this be us, happening to us? I think the thing that hit me that night is it's, it wasn't about Gabby or me or the others that were wounded. It was a much bigger thing, that this had touched people to their core. For many, Sunday was full of shock, grieving and disbelief. Searching for answers during a day filled with news conferences that offered few. Life continued and with it, a return to the work week with no abatement of the grief. We all knew that uh, we would be there at eight o'clock on Monday to open up the office. We all met over the weekend and we grieved together, but we also planned together. They have gone through something that nobody else has ever experienced in Congress. I mean, there's never been a member shot and a staff member die in the history of Congress uh, in that kind of a way. So there was a lot of organization involved in letting the, the constituents have a place to leave their gifts and leave their feelings. And I, I remember it being very um, moving and very difficult. 
I think I was probably still numb. I was shocked and horrified and traumatized and damaged. By keeping busy, uh, we were not just doing the job that Gabby has asked us to do, which was now more important than ever. We didn't allow ourselves that, that space where our mind could drift into the horrible aspects of this. As tragic as this event was, those requests from people in the district don't stop just because of it. So it was important to us because I think we all knew it was important to Gabby that we open the office uh, as usual on Monday, and we did. Every victim who arrived at a hospital alive lived. For those who died, funerals were arranged, remembrances given, and anguish endured. I remember coming home from the hospital and thinking, you know, we just gonna go home and bury ourselves in our, in our house. I'm glad that we did not, uh, well, I'm glad our friends didn't listen to that. Um, and I'm glad we kind of came out of that. I mean, we had to arrange for a funeral for 2,000 people um, in f f less than five days, which was totally amazing. And we could never have done that without the help of our good friends and our family and our church support. And that's why it's important to have people around you. The death of that little girl um, still haunts me. My wife and I went to her wake service, and uh, both my parents died and my brother died, and I never experienced the sadness that I experienced that night. And we waited in line for probably like an hour and 15 minutes, and uh, you know, there wasn't a word spoken. I get very frustrated about newspaper articles, TV, who mention January 8th in the context of Gabriel Gifford suffered a gunshot wound to the head and six other people died. Well, you know, Phyllis Schneck, Dorothy Morris, Dorwin Stoddard, Judge Roll, Christina, Gabe, they're not just other people. We're still proud of her to this day. People have asked us, oh, I can't believe how you've handled this. You know, or, you know, I don't, there's no playbook for, for something like this, um, except we relied on our, what we felt our daughter would have wanted, what she stood for. We went against our instincts and surrounded ourselves with family and friends and, and our church. And then we made sure that we did exactly what we wanted to do, not what others wanted us to do. We lost our dad. Um, he had cancer, and it was just a very long, slow, painful death. And we grieved him. But this is grief on steroids. Immediately after the shootings, I found that I was actually most comfortable uh, at Gabriel's office. In fact, I was sitting at his desk um, for a few days, uh, uh, hanging out with the, the people that he had worked with and, and talking to people. And that, for some reason, that gave me a lot of, of comfort. Beyond memories and grief, the healing became a process that for many is ongoing and perhaps a permanent part of their lives. First, just to accept the reality of the loss. Then the next piece is to feel the feelings about these events and these changes. Again, that might be uh, feeling the feelings about one particular loss or in the case of a community, so many people touched, so many people hurting. Um, then I think we have to really acknowledge that we have to change our relationship uh, with what has changed. 
If I uh, recognize that there's someone lost in my life or some task that I, I feel like I can't do safely anymore, I have to notice that there was energy put into that, that I have to redirect now, I have to soothe myself without forgetting somebody. Really honor the fact that they're gone now. And the energy that I used to put into that relationship, I have to change. I think the biggest piece of grief work, in my own opinion, is action. The unfolding medical drama and recovery efforts riveted listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. News of the tragedy became headlines and lead stories across the globe. The day of the shooting, I was on the phone, I would say constantly, uh, from the moment of the shooting until uh, I went home probably about 10 o'clock that night. Um, and I got home and I looked at my cell phone and I had 253 missed calls from that one day. It was a very difficult time to try and process things because it went from it being a tragic event that happened with my congresswoman to it becoming an international media feeding frenzy. And I think all of the processing that I did was done on camera. We'll have another medical bulletin tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the same location. Uh, but it was important for me to um, emphasize the fact that there were only two people authorized on behalf of the department and the College of Medicine to um, officially speak about the condition of the patients. We will keep this very open and transparent. And all of you I made clear in a brief statement that anything else that the media obtained from experts across the country um, was second-guessing, speculation, and clearly not authorized by us. Peter? I think that uh, the media attention that I got was uh, appreciated by everybody on our team in the hospital. I think we've had some very good positive outcome as a result of it. I think that, in some senses, the, the bitterness of it is that our system, which is getting a lot of notoriety and, and good press, and uh, everybody's been thankful for uh, everybody involved, we wish that carried on to the people uh, that are injured every single day. You know, uh, Dr. Joseph was on call this Saturday, and 25 people came in that day. And those are things that, hack, that, that occur without much attention or, or limelight at all. Uh, so that concludes this uh, uh, press release at this time. Thank For you. me, I just I stopped watching the news and the media altogether for for about a week or so. I just I didn't want to watch it. I didn't want to watch the news. I didn't want to watch anything. I've got my own feelings I'm trying to process. I don't want to listen to somebody else's at that point. It was actually surreal to uh, to know that this place you worked for so long and the things that we do every day be on national television. It was, it was kind of sad that it took an event like this to get them the recognition that they deserve. For the first several days, we were glued to the TV just to know, who did, did they make it? Should we have sent that one second, or should you have sent somebody else first, or, or would that person have survived had, it, had you done a different triage order? So it was very comforting to know, as each person got discharged from the hospital, that whew, the right decisions were made there at the, at the scene. In the first several weeks, we talked to so many reporters who cried when they were talking to us because they were so moved by this event. And I don't know that I'd ever been interviewed by someone who was in tears, but that became very, very commonplace. Individual reaction to the news varied, but to most it was unfathomable. People wanted to help and did. For some, it was lingering hugs and sympathetic listening. Others brought flowers or food. President Obama conveyed the condolences of the nation at Together We Thrive, held at the University of Arizona. The president, during his address, revealed that Representative Giffords had just opened her eyes for the first time. Back in her hospital room, many who had unwaveringly cared for her had missed the joyous news at first. When she opened her eyes the day the president came, her husband had gone down 
to the rally or whatever they had. I was in there with his friend and I was just kind of getting her cleaned up and all of a sudden she opens her eyes and she's looking around and I had I didn't know she'd opened her eyes earlier and I was like oh my god you know <laughs> freaking out and called the nurse in and he was like oh yeah she opened her eyes a little while ago you know and I was telling her where she was at and stuff and I said oh my name is Catherine you know I've been taking care of you for about a week now and she shook my hand and I was just like it's wonderful to meet you so it was all like I said, it was a very intense experience. Tens of thousands of people experienced the memorial in person. The crowd was at times solemn, at times animated. Speaker after speaker testified to the enormous community and individual loss and to the rawness of emotions. But they also spoke of hope of the future, of goodness, and of heroes. I appreciate the sentiment. I must humbly reject the use of the word hero because I am not one. I think what we saw at the Together We Thrive event was really the Tucson community as a whole really moving on to the next step. Because um, up until that point, it had just been about grieving and people were angry and people were upset. I have come here tonight as an American who, like all Americans, kneels to pray with you today and will stand by you tomorrow. It was a very cathartic event. Um, I left there feeling um, uplifted. Uh, I, left there, I left there feeling that uh, the president really um, understood what we were going through. And I thought that, uh, that he delivered exactly what this community needed. Rather than pointing fingers or assigning blame, let's use this occasion to expand our moral imaginations, to listen to each other more carefully, to sharpen our instincts for empathy, and remind ourselves of all the ways that our hopes and dreams are bound together. It was a mixed bag. It was a mixed bag because um, we, of course, were grieving Gabe's loss, and there were very positive things that spoke to us. There was also a bit of cheering and celebration just for having the president there that we weren't in the mood for, but you know, I was trying to be patient about it because most of the people in the crowd hadn't lost a loved one. But I certainly liked um, hearing from him and, and appreciated both what he said to the, the crowd and, and the personal interactions that we had where, where he expressed his grief. Those who died here, those who saved lives here, they help me believe. We may not be able to stop all evil in the world, but I know that how we treat one another, that's entirely up to us. And I believe that for all our imperfections, we are full of decency and goodness that the forces that divide us are not as strong as those that unite us. After the ceremony, President Obama continued to comfort many people in the audience personally. The program was long, and I was pretty tired by the end of it. And so um, I just, without thinking, said, do you mind giving me a ride back to the hospital? <laughs> and he uh, threw his head back and laughed and said, I'd like to, but I don't think I can. I said, I was only teasing. However, I enjoyed the comment of my grown son, um, who always feels that I'm a little forward, I think. And he said, did I just hear correctly? Did you just ask the leader of the free world for a ride? <laughs> I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> 
whether through words delivered into a microphone, notes of condolences, or shared grief, the victims and the community persisted on the long road to recovery. No matter the outcome of that journey, some things would never be the same. I think that with time, all pain eases for everyone. Uh, the memories don't necessarily go away, nor should they. But uh, I think I'm doing as I expected myself to do. I think it affected me more than I thought it would, being a physician and dealing with dramatic, sometimes poor outcomes. Uh, they didn't teach this class in medical school, so no matter how you practice medicine or interact with people, it's, it was a foreign, foreign event that required a lot more thought and processing for me than a, a normal activity in, in one of my days. Having been through the experience of nearly dying, um, life becomes much more precious. My life has changed in terms of what's important and how each day is critical and uh, I don't ever forget that the next minute I might not be here so I'm looking at life a lot differently now. I had the privilege of taking care of Ron Barber and he was critically injured and I, uh, I got to meet him two weeks ago and I have to say of 26 years of nursing that was the most memorable moment of my life being able to take care of a critical patient and then be able to meet him and talk with him. Many of us whose lives were affected very directly, who lost loved ones, our behavior is going to be changed for the rest of our lives. I want to see the behavior of this community change for the better. And that's why we're working on some of the things that we're working on. When an event like this happens, sometimes for those directly involved, sometimes for many, many people in the community, all of a sudden we don't know what to expect anymore. There was illness that day, there was tragedy that day, there was uh, terror that day. And that day as well, there was inspiration and recognition, people reaching out, people um, helping. So that's all part of creating that new reality. Everybody has to make a choice to say, I'm not willing to give up this piece of my corner, my life, my routine. And so I think that can be an inspiration to say, no, this is not where this lands. I'm gonna recreate a sense of safety or normalcy, even if that was briefly taken away. Since my mother's death on that day, I would say that I'm not the same person that I used to be. My life is forever changed. It's the first thing I think about in the morning and the last thing I think about before I go to bed at night. Because it's such a public thing, there, there's something that comes up about it every day. Every day there's something in an email. Um, I turned on the TV the other night and it was on TV. It's on the radio. It's always there. It's always there. I just felt very um, humbled and, and proud that I was there. I had some knowledge. I, I knew what I could do and, and I was able to do it. And I, you know, I kind of, I look at it as, uh, you know, that God placed me there to help those people. I think he placed both of us there. And I was just so grateful that we were there and that we were, be able, we were able to help. For those folks who have a tradition of spirituality or faith, I think it lets them feel not alone. It lets them try to find meaning. What do I make of a world in, in which something like this can happen? So many folks turn to spirit there or um, their idea of God to say, help me make sense of what I can't make sense of. And actually, whether or not this is a spiritual piece, I think so many people have to ask an unanswerable question as part of grief work. We have to ask why. Even if we, we might not ever get the answer, why? In so many settings, we have to say why, why? And sometimes that's why God. And sometimes it's just why I can't understand, I don't know why we had to go through this. 
as I said, even if you don't get the answer, it's important sometimes to ask that question. And there's so many other trauma victims out there and so many other trauma patients that we've cared for for the past years. And, you know, if anything, I hope showcasing this and seeing the survivors of this saying you all can survive and you're all very strong and we're all, you know, human beings are resilient. And, um, you know, it's okay to move on. Um, remember, move on and um, life has purpose. I think as nurses, uh, dealing with situations like this for so long, we like to tell ourselves that we've become emotionally scarred or that um, we have our own defense mechanisms where this stuff doesn't affect us anymore. And the reality of it is, if it doesn't, you're in the wrong profession now. Um, we have no choice. You can't adequately care for a human being through the, the healing process unless you connect with them emotionally. Occupational and physical therapy, counseling, the passage of time, all positive steps on the road to healing. But the destination of being healed may at times be elusive. The wisdom, the little shred of wisdom that perhaps I've pulled out of this mess is that um, for me, the recognition that uh, the, the, the wound will never completely heal. And the, uh, the pain is never going to completely go away. And uh, um, that makes the memories of pre-January 8th uh, seem all the sweeter, uh, all the more special. So you might feel like it's really done. You've done the work, you've talked, you've written, you've cried, and it's done. And then it kind of comes around again. That's very common. Anniversary dates very often bring up a resurgence of uh, feelings or symptoms. Post-traumatic stress disorder is what happens to a normal person in a tragic setting. And it's really based in the ways that our brains take in traumatic stimuli. It is normal. Um, and sometimes people feel as though if they're having symptoms or if they're having symptoms a year later that there must be something wrong and it's just simply not true. When you can sleep nights, when you can reach out again, when you find joy in your life, when you can find the connections that used to be valuable, um, still meaningful to you, when you can start to build on a foundation of something that might feel joyful or positive, those are good signs to look for. People have a tendency to hold everything in and, you know, get a stiff upper lip and move on as if nothing happened, except that something huge has happened. And I think that, I hope that the healing happens sooner in, in a better way by, by sharing the story and, and taking those emotions and expressing them outwardly rather than just keeping them in and pretending maybe like that they don't exist. I went over to Texas in June, and by then she was talking and walking, and we had a wonderful reunion. She looked inquisitive, and I, so I explained that I had been shot in the chest as well. And she, she looked on the edge of tears, and I said, Gabby, you're a strong woman, and I'm a strong woman, and we are both getting better, and it's really good. And she repeated that, strong women. And then I made a joke. I said, I'm a junior high teacher. You can't get a junior high teacher with only two bullets. <laughs> and then she laughed. I can't help but get caught up in um, Pam Simon's smile. I can't help but just get caught up in um, Ron Barber's just boundless energy. Humor and reconnecting with loved ones helps to reestablish a sense of personal normalcy. But reflection turned to action can change the community itself. And I felt the community's response was the most incredible uh, and positive thing you could imagine. But for us as a family, um, we determined very early on that we wanted to do something that turned this tragedy from bad into something good. And in the ICU, as it turned out, we were kind of 
you know, thinking out loud about what we might do uh, to both thank the community for its incredible support as well as to try to hold on to that positive response and energy and do something with it. So we created the Fund for Civility, Respect and Understanding, but the community itself created that space into which we could actually consider this fund's creation. I'm so impressed by Ron on his sick bed, trying to think back how to give back to the community. Um, amazing. Just knowing that I'm helping Ron and that even if one child learns not to bully another child, you know, that is, that is so important to me after January 8th that people learn to respect other people. There's energy to grief. We are struggling uh, sometimes very, very deeply with strong, strong feelings and uh, rearranging beliefs, and we have to do something with that. So taking action in whatever form seems to be a really meaningful thing for many, many people to do. An action might be so simple, it might be saying something to yourself or to your spouse or to a friend. It might be a prayer. It might be writing something. It might have been bringing flowers to those memorials. And then when you start to ripple out, it might be attending a memorial. It might be funding one of the memorial organizations. There are a number of foundations that have sprung up and every one of them can give a community member a way to say, Yes, I think this is important. Yes, I think there's an issue that was unseen before or unaddressed before. How do we take action? There's that action word again. It comes up over and over. How do I take action to say, this mustn't happen again? What can I do to make sure that the community is safe? I think the, the healing power of, of starting a foundation that you have so, so much uh, uh, invested in emotionally I think is very healing. You know, it's going to be based on Christina's ideals and, and uh, you know, uh, her character and ideals. We're going to try to help help the educational uh, system in in areas that uh, that were affected by budget shortfalls. We're going to we're going to help those who are less fortunate, which is right down her alley. The way we look at it is, if we can contribute uh, and maybe show others the way uh, maybe maybe other people can do the same thing you know this is what we need to do as a community and even as a country when the president gave that fantastic speech here in Tucson and used the phrase we need to build a country as good as Christina Taylor Green I immediately thought yes we should we can give that academic standing and it belongs in Tucson because of the tragedy happened here. And I wanted to try and do, turn this into something positive, to turn this angst and pain into something purposeful and optimistic and hopeful for the country has been uh, a salve on the pain I feel for um, my friends who we lost and for the pain I feel for my hometown. The people my son and the other people in the shootings died because we live in the most powerful nation in the history of the earth. We have enormous military power, enormous personal power, enormous freedoms. People were exercising those freedoms to assemble and to conduct the democratic process. What we Individuals in our society have access to weapons with horrific destructive powers. That's a fact of life in our society. I do not think that our sense of responsibility, given our great freedoms and our great access to, to power, including destructive power, I don't think that our mechanisms for, responsibil for responsible behavior match up adequately to our access to power. And that everybody should think about that. I really am hopeful that the legacy of January the 8th will not be of a man who came in and shot indiscriminately into the crowd and injured the congresswoman, but it's gonna be 
After January the 8th, the Tucson community came together and addressed this issue, and they came together and they changed this. I think we're, we're starting to see the long-term legacy of what the people of Tucson came up with after one person really changed everything, but really made us realize that nothing had changed because we were always that community that would go out of their way to help others. It's now, it's been amplified and, and really become something that's much more prominent than it was before. To learn more about this program, please visit Arizona Public Media on the web at originals.azpm.org forward slash Together We Heal.